Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists and local political leaders about the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, our special post election show looks behind the headlines from the June 5th primary. With a big assist from Mayor Kathy Murillo, Westside voters elect one of their own to council. The status quo wins big at the county as two insurgent challenges fall short. A look behind the winners and losers of election day. And what's the future for Republicans in California as their numbers plummet? Our panel tonight, Tyler Hayden, news editor of The Independent. Indie executive editor, Nick Welsh. Catherine Barnes, producer for KCRW, and Santa Barbara conservative leader Dale Francisco. Thank you all for coming. So Tyler, what looked like was going to be a squeaker for city council in District 3 turned out not to be that close after all. How was uh, Oscar Gutierrez able to win more than half the votes in a four-person contest? I think it was a, it was a combination of things. Um, first, I think Michael Vidal, as hard as he worked, as many doors as he knocked on, uh, he raised quite a bit of money, almost as much as Oscar. I think he, I think he remained kind of a, um, a question mark for a lot of people. I don't think people could quite figure him out um, as a person, as a candidate. Um, I, my first interaction with him was even a little confusing. I'd been emailing with him to set up our first interview, and the first thing he says when he meets me is, I thought you'd be shorter. <laughs> and I just didn't know what to make of that. I was like, is that supposed to be funny? Is that like a... Well, was, he, he, and he said he was 6'6". Okay, so, so that's no way thing. he's 6'6". Okay, right. So why, why are we even talking about his height? But that's confusing, too. So... <laughs> How he, tall uh, are you? I'm 6'2". <laughs> oh, okay. He said he was 6'7". I think when I, I, when I stood next to him, I didn't feel 5-inch difference. But anyway... Um, so, so, so that was the key oh, that's to a the super, whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's my analysis. So that's the superficial. Not tall enough. Yeah, that's the that's the surface stuff. But beyond that, um, you know, he he never voted in a city election. He really had never been involved in city politics. Nobody had ever heard his name. Um, he's you know he's a, he's a successful guy. He's been in the um, sort of wealth management sector for a while. But you know, I got I never got the feeling that his neighbors knew him like they knew Oscar. Um, and and he just he never quite sort of got the traction that you need in a, in a city race and especially in a, in a district election where you're really only, you know, you're, you're trying to rack up a few hundred votes. Um, he just never made that connection. Oscar also had a really compelling personal narrative. I mean, he, he you know, he, he, he grew up here, he was raised here. Michael grew up in Fresno, um, struggled in high school, got involved with videography and really kind of got into that. Eventually went Former to- Former director of Newsmakers, that probably was worth- That was huge. Uh, <laughs> that's a big one, um, and he and so and he he made it, you know, and he's 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 yeah, he's yeah. a Santa Barbara guy, and, and the and, mayor, and the mayor that that was a big one, you know, she she donated five thousand dollars to a campaign, that's no small amount. She was with him every step of the way. Um, some people would say holding his hand sometimes, you know. Would some people would. Yeah, mm -hmm, would speak, and he did. Yeah, <laughs> it, might be sitting with one, um, and and would you know even speak for him at, at events sometimes yeah. during endorsement meetings. But so she was a big booster of his. He still, I thought, um, did well during the debates. Um, kind of came into his own throughout the campaign. Yeah. Uh, you know, was really impressive with us when we would talk to him and during interviews. So he he, he didn't win it because of her. Uh, I don't think, but it was uh, it was certainly a, a factor. You you talked to Oscar at the I did. beginning. I spoke with both Oscar and Michael Vidal. And what did you end up doing? Me. Did you did I, you endorse Michael? I gave each of them the best advice I could, uh, and I told them pretty much the same thing. They were both asking questions about how do you run a campaign and what's it like being on city council, those kinds of questions. So I, I said the same thing to both of them. Now, at near the very end of the campaign, uh, Michael asked if I would endorse him, and I said yes. And the reason I said yes. And let, let me uh, be very clear here. I like Oscar. He's a good guy. Um, the thing that Michael brought that I think was unique, and it was the only, he was the only candidate with a solid finance background. And if you don't have that background, you're going to spend at least the first two years on council getting it. And I think that's the most important thing council does. Yeah. You endorsed uh, Oscar. Yeah. You met with both of them. Why'd you go with Oscar? 
Oh, because we're stooges over there. That's what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the Democratic Party. Kathy Maria called up and said, hey, Nick, I know you didn't endorse me, but we didn't endorse Oscar. And he said, oh, why didn't you put it like that? No, Oscar, Oscar came in and... Um, Kathy Maria, a former employee of the Santa Barbara Independent. She, um, yeah. Uh, Oscar came in and he was just very um, winning in, in the uh, endorsement interview. He was very persuasive. Um, you know, he, he felt like he was grounded in the community, whereas um, Michael, you know, he seemed like the guy you might want to sit next to at a dinner party, and, but you weren't quite sure if you wanted to ha put him on the city council bench. Um, Did, would you like to sit next to Oscar at a dinner party? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you would like yeah. to sit... I sit next to anybody at a dinner party. <laughs> um, you know, but... Um, Michael, again, he was sort of a question mark, and it was, um, there was this really fast intelligence, but where have you been? And, you know, he has been involved in some aspects of the community, but the fact that he didn't even vote in the presidential race. Um, or the mayoral Or any of the mayoral races. That's just like, okay, that's a little, you know, it's not a fatal flaw, but it does make you wonder. Yeah. One of the things you do at KCRW is you do local news to go with the, the um, Los Angeles-based stuff. Mm -hmm. But how do you decide like what's where the focus is? I assume that District Three was a little too local. Local. We covered it a little bit. I mean, our our listener base is Ventura and Santa Barbara, so sometimes we don't want to get too too hyper local in the city, just so that you know people in Oxnard can still relate to the news we're covering. So. Um, we were definitely following it, and uh, but but uh, more in the way of you know who's getting endorsed by who, who's leading the race, um, um, not so much the nitty gritty of, of interviewing each person, getting uh -huh. each person into the studio. Yeah. So what do we think uh, on a scale of one to five, with five being absolutely in Kathy's pocket and zero being uh, in Jason's pocket? Uh, where, <laughs> where is uh, where is Oscar going to land? I think. Oscar is a solid two. Oh. Two and a half. I think I think he might surprise us in his um, individuality. I I I don't know, maybe he just was convincing, but when we spoke to him during the endorsement interview and he talked about sort of his um, tendency to not just run with the crowd and to not just do what he's told. Um, and he gave examples of that over his life and I I believe it. Um, I it'll be that it's one thing to, to say it's another thing to, to practice it um, and when he's up there and he's got to be making decisions and he's got to be processing all this information a lot of it financial she's twisting his arm yeah and she and she's getting he's getting pressure from all angles and that you know that'll be sort of the the um, telling telling moment but for now I think I think he's uh, he's convinced himself that he's gonna run his own course all right, real quick zero to five. I put, Five it three. Three. I put it's going to be three. I, I think in a lot of ways, I don't know if it's going to be hip pocket. I think uh, they have a natural um, affinity. I think a lot of like, renters' rights issues, which are going to be coming up uh, uh, shortly after this election, I think he's already there. They're sort of moving in the same direction. I think there may be some interesting differences in terms of housing density and AUD, yeah. ADU type stuff. Um, I think he's going to be more his own person than the uh, caricature stereotype has it. All right. What, what kind Agreed. of pressure is he going to face? Well, I, I agree with Tyler. I mean, based on my conversation with him, Oscar, Oscar had his own ideas. And certainly the endorsement of the Democratic Party and the support of Kathy Murillo made a, made a significant difference for In him. There's idea. no question yeah. about that. Yeah. But I, I, I think he's sincere. And what he told me was he knows what he wants to do, and he's not going to be led around by anyone else. You want to weigh in on this, zero to five? Well, I think just looking at the whole council together, collectively, I mean, it just shows that the district elections are kind of doing what they were intended to do, which was to bring more minorities into, into leadership roles here and really have people born and bred in the west side, yeah. you know, represent the west side. Uh, and now we're starting to get to see Three. that. Three Latinos on the yeah uh, on their yeah, list. but whether or not they can make you know some really tough decisions on housing and transportation and you know that's we'll see. All right, the correct answer is two point five. Mm. Tyler's right. All right. <laughs> All right. So the Independent batted a thousand. Is that true with its endorsements? But the one I have to say that surprised me was Betsy Schaefer easily winning the auditor controller race. 
uh, despite the attacks and allegations of corruption by Jen Christensen. What happened there? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I spoke with And her. the $2 million <laughs> embezzlement, which you said last week was couch change. <laughs> I, I think what I said is if you factor $2 million embezzled over a nine-year period by nine different people, that was not enough to buy enough opioids to get constipated. No. Uh, I think that was. So what you had I did. rehearsed that line. Is that <laughs> <laughs> I did the math on the spot. And the uh, opioids. <laughs> I, I will say. Um, You're right, by the way. It's only about uh, two hundred and fifty dollars. You just do that by wow. hand. Wow! Good work. Jeez. Long division. Yeah. Arithmetic. Not bad. Bad. <laughs> and and, and uh, the, uh, I don't know if she was the ringleader, but she was the first one to be sentenced. Lynn Hoden just was sentenced yeah. to nine years. So we have the number nine for those who are numerologically uh, predisposed. Uh, so nobody cared about Jen Christian. No. Um, you know what? By the time you got through reciting it last time, I think 90% of your viewers had fallen asleep. <laughs> it's, a, it's a complicated... So 90% sort of, of two million. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very complicated sort of nuanced uh, shade of uh, conflict of interest. And I think the problem was is that Jen Christensen was so focused on bringing that message that she forgot to identify and define herself. And so nobody mm. really got a sense of who Jenny Christensen was other than she was out there banging the hammer on Betsy Schaefer, who nobody ever heard of, of uh, running for a position that nobody who even covered it still knows what they did. I talked to Betsy's campaign manager on the day of the election, Mary Rose, Mary Rose and she goes, I can't believe at this stage of my life I'm talking about the auditor controller's race. And I can't believe even more that hey, that's I'm right about the school board. <laughs> that, 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 We're all working our way down <laughs> the third letter. That, that, that is a hot race of Santa Barbara County. <laughs> and it turns out it wasn't. Yeah. And, and uh, I think probably in that particular one, the Democratic Party, the big D, uh, did make a difference. Um, I think, um, and, and Jen isn't really so much a Republican, not that that would have helped her that much, but she's sort of in that in-between zone. And I think when you're in that in-between zone, it doesn't really, you don't fly. Yeah, well, she, she was declined to stay. She used to be a Republican. Though. She used to be a Republican. Were you, That's right. Did you think she was uh, stronger than that, than, than she ended up? I thought she, I, I thought she would have done better, uh, partly because she had the name recognition based on the supervisor's race two years ago. Right yeah, I, so I, I, I thought she would have done better. And I think it's, it's hard for, for candidates to really know how they appear to the public. And I have to agree with Nick, if, if most of your appearance is combative and it's about an issue that most people don't know about, that's probably not going to work well. Uh, if it's an issue that people really care about and are concerned about, that can work very well. Yeah, the other county big race was the sheriff. Um, and two challengers just got what what Bill Brown ended up with like fifty four percent. Yeah, would you? What was your take on that? I was a little surprised. I thought someone would go on to November to to run against him, um, but I think kind of the same thing happened in a way. Like the two lieutenants, they didn't do a great job of really saying who they were, and their platforms were all issues that I don't think like the common Santa Barbara resident resonates with like a lot of it was so interdepartmental mm -hmm. it was all about overstaffing in the uh, understaffing in the jails um, mandatory overtime low morale those are important things but to you and me that's just going on in the department we might not care about that yeah. um, and they kind of didn't talk as much as maybe they should have about really things that resonate with us so mandatory evacuations yeah. um, immigration they talked a little bit about it um, but but that wasn't really the forefront of. You know, I thought Eddie Sway talked about uh, mental health and the and the need for the mm -hmm. law enforcement to address that, but that wasn't something that ever surfaced. It really didn't get out there. Well, you know, it, it didn't. But then towards the end, um, you know, it is interesting. Eddie Sway, for those who don't know him, he's a 32 year uh, lieutenant, or he's with the department 32 years, and he sort of. Uh, cobbled together a, a program to get uh, deputies and um, 
non-soaring officers trained in conflict intervention uh, strategies so that you know you don't wind up getting into fights or shooting uh, people who are mentally ill and can't really even comply with the orders. Um, and he made that a big deal. Um, and I think Brian Olmsted, who was the other challenger in the race, a 30-year veteran, he sort of picked up some of that towards the end. Bill Brown, uh, the timing was coincidental, but it looked strategic. Um, at a board of supervisors meeting, shows up with, I have in my hands a blueprint for the future for mental health. He had, he had not done that previously. And he hadn't done that previously. He served um, at Jerry Brown, the governor's uh, behest on the statewide mental health commission, and shows up at the board of supervisors in the you know height of election season with the blueprint yeah. uh, that yeah. he was talking about. Um, so the issue... I think what did come out of, of the race um, from the mental health point of view is that the, the personnel, they had a six-hour um, budget. They have six hours a week budgeted for this position. Now they have 30 hours. So, you know, Something. a 500% increase for people who do math. Well, thank you, Eddie. Let me check that. Oh. <laughs> well, and he brought up the whole like dogs bringing dogs in to help to help right. inmates, oh, yeah. and oh, that was like two days kitten. before oh. the election. Oh, or yeah. something. it was dog training and cat socialization. <laughs> uh, who is going to socialize a cat? <laughs> and that, well, I think no, but that was only for the female inmates. Yeah. <laughs> only the female inmates got the yeah. cats. Yeah. The male inmates got the dogs. Oh, that's and, and, and the county. This is for the new county jail that won't be opening up till way late next year. All right. All right, Catherine, so the big uh, story in California that was being watched in Washington was um, whether Democrats were going to have any success in going after these seven House seats that are held by Republicans, but where uh, Hillary Clinton beat Trump um, yeah. in 2016. One of them is in our area in Ventura, uh, the 25th, with Steve Knight, and I know you were watching that. And then on the other side, uh, Republicans are maybe going to go after Salute Carbajal yeah. because they need a couple. What 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 was going on in the House? Yeah, so like nationwide, there's this whole blue wave, you know, idea that we need to, if, if we want to, if Democrats want to flip the House, you know, then they'll have to get 23 seats. Um, and seven of those potential seats are in California. Actually, I think 10 are competitive where a Democrat could win over a Republican. Um, seven of those did vote for Hillary in 2016, so they're thinking those are even potentially more likely. Um, but, and the good thing is they were worried during the primaries that there were too many Democratic candidates for each of these seven districts and that they would split the vote and maybe two Republicans. Because of, of the top two primaries. Yeah, so maybe two Republicans would go forward in November. That was a worry, but um, all of those districts now have a Democrat and a Republican and going what, forward in November. what does the 25th November. look like? So the 25th, there's a Republican, Steve Knight. He's been, I think he's been the congressman for a while now. I don't know how, how long, but Several long time. number of terms. Yeah, yeah. Um, well-liked, I think, in the district, but... Uh, I guess the, the district is turning a little bit more blue. They were one of the ones who voted for Hillary in 2016. And uh, the, the Democratic contender going into November, her name is Katie Hill. She's, I think, 30. She's new to politics. She was the left liberal mm -hmm. Democrat. So Steve Knight got, a, I think, about 52%. She got 20%. So, you know... Not that much, but uh, there were three other, I think there were three other Democrats racing. So the Democratic mm -hmm. vote was like 48. Which yeah, if you added like the them ball. all up, they still yeah. wouldn't get to him. But um, but it's a primary. You know. Yeah, but, you know, I think even though the Democrats see this as a victory, that each of these um, races are going to have a Democratic contender, it's still an up, uphill battle for a lot of these districts. And do the, does Justin Fareed have any... A realistic chance of knocking off Salute if the Republicans get behind him with a whole bunch of money? I think they might. I mean, they they did last time he ran. They put, I mean, there was money going into that campaign. Um, and so that's kind of the opposite, that they think maybe they could flip this blue district red with Justin Freed. I don't know. Is, I think, do you think Justin can is, can do that? Or? I, you know, that, that <laughs> that's a race that... Uh, uh, you know, I, I feel for Justin because I like Justin a lot, and any any Republican running in a district like this in the first term of the Trump presidency is, is really fighting an uphill battle. Because, because you got to decide 
Well, obviously part of Salud's strategy, I assume, will be to tag Justin with Trump, uh, which is what happened last time around. And uh, I don't think that's really an accurate uh, characterization of Justin Fareed, but uh, that will happen. And the antipathy towards Trump in this district is just extreme. So uh, I, I just, like I said, I think it's very much an uphill battle. However, I do think it's interesting. One of the highlights for me on election night was John Cox, who I respect, uh, winning that second position. Okay, and for governor. For governor. And that was part of Kevin McCarthy's strategy, whatever you may think of Kevin uh, McCarthy. Uh, House Majority Leader from uh, Bakersfield. Exactly. And, and he felt that unless we had a Republican in the, in the gubernatorial race, that the turnout in those districts that Kathy's talking about wouldn't be enough. Yeah. So, were you surprised by uh, how how poorly Michael Aaron Woody did? I thought he was a big winner. Come on, he got eleven percent. <laughs> whoever whoever heard of Michael Aaron Woody? He got eleven percent. I think. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, your your point about Cox is a good one, and you couple that with um, the uh, repeal of the gas tax that's going to be on the ballot in November. Mm -hmm particularly in Orange County, where a number of those flippable three seats are, them. three yeah. of them are, um, which is such a volatile place right now, um, you know, I think that's going to make it that much harder for Democrats to, to flip those. That's a 12-cent gas tax yeah. that the Democrats basically passed two years two ago, years ago. And so, for infrastructure. And, and, and Cox is making that a very big deal. Yeah, and, I, and Sanctuary and, State yeah. as well, where a lot of local jurisdictions. And certainly in Orange County, you know, you see a big uh, reaction to that, against that. Any way Justin could beat Salud? I don't know. I was, just, I was just thinking, I haven't so far seen him do anything different, for better or for worse, this round than he has the last You don't find him two. more jolly? I, I could, okay, I guess you could argue that. He's a little more Plus upbeat. Plus he invited you to his victory party. Yeah, that was so nice. Yeah. Well, summer After, hasn't hit. The rodeo season, right, the okay, fairs, right. got to hit all yep. those spots. A lot of cotton, can cotton candy and smiles. and yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I guess he, if he gets a lot of money and, and um, there's a big enough turnout, then it's possible. I just, I, I, I just don't know what his message is. Really. Right. I guess that's the, that's it. I'm how, not how he's, salute. I mean, right. it's what we were talking I'm about. Not, it's the same talking points the last couple of years, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. He doesn't, I, and I think it is true. It's like, right now, Either you're with Trump or, or, or uh, against Trump. And both positions are untenable for him. And anything else will seem like prevarication. And he just doesn't feel like he's got his mojo going this time around as much as he did last time. And unless the lube really comes and steps on it uh, in some heinous way, um, I think uh, he's going to be painted in as a Trump surrogate whether he likes it or not. Yeah. So the Republican Party, Dale, uh, just before the election, the 10-day uh, report um, by the Secretary of State is now the th only the third largest right. voting block behind right. decline to state. Yes, indeed. Steve Poisner, who used to be a, re a Republican, ran for, uh, actually, other than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the last guy elected to a statewide office who ran as a Republican. He was the insurance commissioner. Mm ran again for uh, insurance commissioner. He finished first, but he's running as an independent now. Mm -hmm. Is that what Republicans have to do in the long <laughs> term? I mean, is the brand you know, so tarnished? I, uh, from my point of view, I see the Republican Party as a very split organization, and it wouldn't surprise me if the Republican Party as constituted disappeared in the next couple of decades. I think you have such an enormous gulf between what I would call the Republican establishment the Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, Bush family, et cetera, John McCain, whatever. John Cox. <laughs> you know, I think John Cox, just to divert real quickly there, John Cox was seen as more of a centrist Republican. That's why McCarthy advised Trump to endorse him, because Travis Allen probably didn't stand any chance outside of Orange County. And, and I, I think there's truth in that. but. I see Cox as someone who actually has, he is an independent thinker with his own ideas. So that I, I would say, yes, he's more centrist, but no, he's not establishment, from my point of view. But anyway, that establishment piece of the Republican Party is increasingly unpopular with the base of the Republican Party. And so that other the side. Trump, the Trump 
Well, the base. Trump, the Trump base, the the people who are not members of the ruling class and don't want to be the constitutionalist Tea Party, that that whole conglomeration of people, which includes a lot of working class Democrats and working class independents, uh, is a new constellation in American politics and may need its own party. Interesting. Um, as a member of the ruling class and a millennial, Catherine, <laughs> <laughs> do you, you know, uh, Gavin Newsom ran a bunch of ads, a couple million dollars worth of ads, attacking Cox as being too close to Trump in an attempt to get to increase the vote for Cox, um, and he got some criticism from the Democrats. Do you think that Cox being on the ticket and basically setting up this Trump versus anti-Trump thing helps in those seats or hurts in those seats in terms of the turnout, those House seats we were talking about? I I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's going to be hard because in 2016, you know, it was a presidential election. I don't know if people are going to turn out. I mean, a governor's race is very important, but but maybe they won't turn out in the same way that they did in 2016 on, on I guess, both sides. Um, you know, people, more people voted for Hillary in those districts, but that's not to say that they will come out in 2018. Yeah, and historically, midterms are, they get more intensive Republican votes because they vote as a hobby. So. <laughs> responsibility, <All right>. responsibility. <laughs> yeah, so whatever. All right, so that's, uh, we're out of time. Thanks to... Tonight's panel, Tyler Hayden, Nick Welsh, Catherine Barnes, and Dale Francisco, thank you all for watching. Uh, please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, to check out my blog posts on politics and media in Santa Barbara and behind, beyond, uh, and our YouTube channel, where you'll, where you'll find an archive of our past shows and special interviews. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Catherine, Suzanne, Ryan, Kyle, and Lauren. And as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy senior executive producer, Hap Freund. This is the last show of our winter-spring season, and uh, we will be back with you uh, after Labor Day. Um, so uh, thanks again for watching. See us in summer reruns, and we'll see you after vacation. Good night.